we are talking to Lisa today, uh, Lisa Niver an award-winning travel expert and science teacher. She's explored 101 countries and six continents. She's a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania where my brother went. Uh, and she worked on cruise ships for seven years uh, and backpacked for three years all over Asia. She knows uh, Asia really well. And she talks about her travels on KTLA TV and uh, she has videos uh, with over 1.3 million views on YouTube channel that are called We Said Go Travel. Uh, she and you know as she founded that uh, she became uh, number three on Rise Global's top 1,000 travel blogs and that's quite a feat because there's hundreds of thousands of travel blogs out there. Uh, uh, and, you know, the uh, We Said Go Travel uh, is read in 235 countries, that blog. Uh, so she is a top 10 travel influencer. She's also a top 50 female influencer. Uh, and we're just glad to have her uh, with us here on our channel. We're hoping that she's going to tell us how to become an amazing travel blogger, uh, a travel journalist. And also, you know, we're hoping that she will be able to give us some kind of uh, information on maybe when we can all start traveling more safely abroad. All right. So, Lisa, welcome to our show. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for having me on your show. I always love speaking with you. It was such a joy to speak with you last month and talk about your amazing books. And I'm honored to be here with you for Reimagine. Oh, excellent. Thank you so much. So um, tell us a little bit about where you get your travel bug from. Is this something from a family thing? Like your parents never let you out of the house. And so all of a sudden, when it was time for you to travel, you just went crazy. That's a good question. I, I, um, I feel that that would be an excellent next book for you. That's like the start of an interesting character. But um, in actuality, I learned to love travel with my family. We actually went on a cruise uh, when I was around 13 and we were in the Mediterranean and we saw the pyramids in Egypt and the Parthenon in Greece. And it was like my history books opened up and turned into reality. And I had always thought it was maybe a little bit boring and dry. And then to actually be in the places, I was like, this is like magic. So it was... I think that instantly I was hooked. Oh, wow. Okay. So that is amazing. So you're traveling in a, at a very early age. So that's fantastic. Yeah, it was um, very, very lucky. Yeah. And um, when you went backpacking for three years in Asia, yes. uh, were you at all concerned about safety, your health, you know, all the things that women are told to be aware of when they travel? Uh, to be honest, I always am thinking about safety. You had mentioned in my bio, I spent seven years working on cruise ships. And when you work on a cruise ship, you drill twice a week, once with the guests and once crew. And I am always thinking about safety. I'm, I also am a waterfront lifeguard and I'm a scuba dive master. So safety is always going in my brain. And you know, one of the things I noticed when I worked on ships is people would come on board and my first position, I worked in the children's program and people would say to me, where's my child? And I would say, well, there's 50, at the time we had 1500 guests. I said, well, there's 1500 people on board and <laughs> 12 decks. And when you said goodbye to your child, what was your plan to find your child? Oh, we don't have a plan. <laughs> so, so I learned really quickly um, and you need to have a plan. And so that I think is one of the things that's really important, whether you're backpacking, whether you're on a cruise, you know, we're very dependent right now on devices, but we used to travel and plan a lot in advance. Like I have my map and I know where I'm going. I think that was really good training. Yeah, you're right. Because now we seem to plan on the fly. We look at our um, device and we go, okay, uh, I guess I can go to the rooftop garden here and have a drink. It's open right now and I can even see the menu. So yeah, it's a very different, I, I didn't even think about that, that it's a very different kind of planning now that we do than we used to do before. Well, I, I noticed it during COVID. I had a three-day travel conference in January and 
unfortunately, there were 550 people on the conference and we had all these networking meetings and unfortunately the platform collapsed. And so I had printed everything. So I just started calling everybody. I'm like, hi, we're supposed to have a meeting right now. Do you want to just do it on the phone? And someone said to me, why did you have it printed? I said, why didn't you have it printed? Because you always have to plan for contingency. I think this is so true when you travel. You know, you have to plan for the contingencies. And now I think when we travel, uh, it's much easier if we forget something in our suitcase. We can always find another drugstore or another, um, you know, uh, food uh, 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 supply or whatever. You know, there's always something else that we can do. No matter what part of the world we're in, basically, we can always find things, you know, unless we're really in the outback or something. But um. <laughs> it was it was funny. I was on a trip once um, and the trip I was on ended in Germany. And I went to stay with a cruise ship friend in Italy on my way to Israel and my bag disappeared. And it was very interesting what was gone that I missed. And so the one item that I realized I make the mistake, I used to make the mistake of putting in a packed bag is I wear daily contact lenses. And that was not a rapidly solvable problem. Oh. But it, what did turned you do? Out, <laughs> it turned out there was a lovely woman coming to meet the group of journalists I was meeting with in, in Israel coming from Arizona. And so my mom had a key to my apartment and she got my con my contacts <laughs> and she sent them to Arizona. <laughs> wow. And it worked. Oh my God. And then the funny thing was the whole trip, we kept talking about what can you not live without? And so one woman said, oh my gosh, I only like this one kind of underwear. And I was like, okay. And <laughs> someone else said, I couldn't possibly live without my brand of makeup. Oh, and it was very interesting. Like most of the people I was with all journalists and most people are fairly flexible, but it was interesting. Like at one point, I, you know, I didn't, I rebought a bunch of stuff in Italy with my friend, but you know, I think I had one dress. So one night, one of the other women was like, do you want to wear one of my dresses? <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, that's nice. That's nice. Um, I think, you know, I wonder what is the one thing I can't live without? You know, I cannot live without my hairbrush. I like my hairbrush. Uh, it, it doesn't, it doesn't comb the same way if I'm using a different hairbrush. It has to be that hairbrush. <laughs> the other thing that I had with me that I, I am guessing might be something you also couldn't live without is I, if I didn't have my Kindle, I don't know what I would do. I have to be able to read. Oh, I, I, I actually don't uh, travel with anything like that. I still favor physical books. Oh, you do? Still, yeah, I have to buy a paperback at the airport. I have to buy it, you know, wherever I end up landing. If there is a, a bookstore there, um, I will always, yeah, grab a paperback. Yeah. <laughs> I am old school. Um, I love it. <laughs> so, um, and, you know, in your um, career, uh, both as a travel journalist and as somebody, I think, who has um, just a broad range of experiences around the world, you have um, interviewed a lot of very uh, influential people, including like Deepak Chopra and Olympic medal gold medalists and so on. Uh, has there been anybody you've interviewed who gave you an insight that you had not considered before? Interviewing Deepak Chopra was, I felt so um, surprised and happy and lucky to spend that time with him. Uh -huh. The thing that was interesting speaking with him was, you know, he started talking about his early struggles and how challenging it was when he first came to the United States from India. And I really appreciated how candid and honest he was. And I think that's the thing I find with anyone I speak to, especially, you know, if you speak to an author and you've read their characters, like when we spoke about your book, like I thought it was so um, in, like vulnerable and sharing that you said about how you re-envision this whole life for your own mother. Mm -hmm. you know, like I, I feel very honored when people are willing to share part of their life with me. Yeah, uh, I think that, you know, it depends on the kind of interviewer you have. If you have an interviewer who's interested in that, um, then I think you feel like, okay, maybe I can express something of myself here. So speaking of that, 
tell us about your most vulnerable moment traveling. I have a bunch of very vulnerable moments that I've been writing about for my memoir. I'm working on my own book about my divorce. And then I did 50 challenges before I turned 50. I, I've been describing the end of my, er the end of my marriage as quite ugly. That's, I guess, the catchphrase for things totally became a complete disaster and I had to leave for my safety. So writing all of that um, and all of that was while traveling. He's who I was backpacking with in Asia. And while we had amazing moments, you know, we were in Borobudur, we were in Bagan, you know, we went to iconic places. Like in India, I was in Alora Caves and Ajunta Caves. Oh. I mean, we went to um, Kumbh Mela in Allahabad. Wow. Right. So those were highlights. But some of our interpersonal interaction, like we arrived once in a tiny town in India at sunset. Um, from the bus. We'd been on the bus for, I don't know, eight hours, 24 hours, a long time. And there were some tuk-tuk drivers offering to take us to the guest house. And my companion started uh, close to an altercation at sunset with 10 local men. So that that's not good. Right. That's vulnerable. <laughs> <laughs> so there, there have been times writing the book. I don't know if, if you have this. I know when you're, I imagine when you're writing about your characters that you feel them. Yeah. But writing memoir and writing my own experience. There's times where I literally, I sit Cringe. at my. You're, 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 you're cringing because you are remembering everything and reliving it. Right. <laughs> Well, actually, I write until I'm pretty sure I'm going to throw up and then I lie on the floor. Wow. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's wow. <laughs> it's that visceral. How many years ago was this that you've been carrying this around? Um, I left uh, from Thailand. The, the last day I saw him was in February 2014. Wow. So, and, and it's still that emotional for you, still that visceral. I think when I'm writing, um, you know, I've, I've had a coach tell me, you know, it'd be really great if you could have one foot in the present and one foot in the past and not feel it so much. Mm -hmm. And I think that's great advice. But for me to really write it, I feel like it's hard not to be completely in it. And it is draining, but I also think it's getting it out, you know, like it's leaving my body. Good, good, yeah. Well, as long as you brought up writing, let's talk about what it takes to be a really good travel writer. How does one go about doing it? How does one go about um, interviewing uh, amazing people uh, in your journey as you have? How do you go about getting other people to pay for your travel so you can write about it? That is the million dollar question. I mean, it is you know, obviously during COVID, I have not been traveling. But um, before that, I, I really had gotten to a point where I was going the most incredible places. And I actually, I put on my turtles. I don't know if you can see them. Yeah. These, this was from my very last trip before COVID. I went to the Galapagos. Oh. And I sailed on EcoVentura, which is an incredible tour company. Uh, it was a, a Relais Chateau yacht. And honestly, every day I just kept thinking, I must have done something good. Because <laughs> this trip is incredible. And, and like you said, I've had amazing opportunities. I went with um, the tour company Abercrombie and Kent mm -hmm. to Tanzania and Kenya. And that was part of my 50 things before I turned 50. I had reached out. I w always wanted to go on safari. And I started writing to companies and they invited me to come write about it. And I, th I think for me, the thing that's made the biggest difference is the video. Why is that? Well, I feel like, um, you know, I, I obviously take a lot of pictures and like you said, I interview people and I write about it, but I feel that, you know, YouTube is now the second largest search engine on the planet. And I'm, 
always amazed. I did a trip to the Solomon Islands for the 75th anniversary of the Battle of Guadalcanal. Mm -hmm. And I was in a lot of um, three different islands. And it's, it, it happens that people write to me like, oh, I see my uncle in your video. You know, people are searching for stuff. Or I was in Samoa, you know, many years before that. And um, some people picked us up on the side of the road. We had taken a bus. There was supposed to be a taxi. There wasn't. We started walking. And it was so hot. It was the kind of hot where you think your sneakers are going to melt. Yeah. And this family picked us up and took us to their house. And we filmed the whole thing. And I wrote about it. And I wrote about how these people saved us. And I have tons of comments on the video from their family. They're like, oh, we haven't seen them in years. <laughs> oh, that's so cool. Well, so you've written for National Geographic and AAA Explorer and USA Today. So is it always you initiating, um, you know, to them, okay, I would like to tell a story or initiating with the tour companies. I would like to take this tour. It's on my bucket list and I will write about it. And here's my pedigree. Is that, is it, is it largely your initiative? Because that's a huge initiative you take. You know, over the years, it's been a lot of different ways. So, um, you know, I, I go to a lot of conferences and I used to go to a, a travel magazine conference and I met with different editors. And in fact, so here's something funny about me. I travel with a hula hoop. Oh, so <laughs> it's collapsible. It comes in pieces. So at the conference, everybody knew I hula hooped because they saw me. And so one of the editors said to me, you know, would you teach me? Can I hula hoop with you? And then she actually pitched me an article. That's how I wrote for AARP is they asked me to write an article about travel fitness. The, oh. funniest, the funniest part was one of the caveats on the pitch was you may not write about hula hooping. <laughs> Because it's a brand name. <laughs> no, I think it's just not, they wanted something. They, I mean, there's such a big magazine, and I they wanted fitness on the road. Like, what can people do? So I interviewed three different, um, not gurus, but one of the people I interviewed was Ruth Bader Ginsburg's trainer. Oh yeah, <laughs> he was lovely. He was lovely. But they wanted they wanted activities like what could you do in any gym, any hotel. So hula hooping was just too specific, but so that they pitched me most of my stories I've pitched, but some of them have been funny. Like I was pitching, I had met the editor from uh, Sierra club magazine uh -huh. and I was pitching a story and I wrote to her, you know, if we don't figure this out before Thursday, I'll be offline because I'm going to be in Utah skiing with the blind. <laughs> And, and she and said, what? <laughs> she said, that's the story I want. <laughs> and I, I, in my head, I thought that's not a pitch, but who cares? It worked. So wow. sometimes you do what everybody says, you know, you write uh. these long pitches and you're so enthusiastic. And I have to say at least three or four times in my career, my PS has pitched a story. Now I do it on purpose, but in the beginning it was an accident. I just was like sharing information. But now I always put like one extra thing because it's hard to know what people want. Yeah. What's a PS? Uh, I, when we used to write letters, handwritten PS. Oh, that PS. Okay. Postscript. Bottom, okay. Postscript. That I always, because even it happened for me with TV. My producer and I were talking about a, a segment for Tahiti and I was negotiating with the, the, the PR firm and the flights and what was going to happen. And I said to her, by the way, you know, if we don't get this solved by Thursday, I'm going to be out of town in Ogden, Utah. And she wrote me back, I want that. I was like, what? <laughs> Why were you, I just have to digress here. Why were you skiing with the blind? What was that oh, all about? Oh my goodness. I love this project. So the National Ability Center is an amazing, amazing place in Park City, Utah, uh -huh. where they work with people of all different abilities 
And I grew up skiing in Park City. My dad, I often say, would rather ski than breathe. Oh, okay. We skied a lot. Okay. Unfortunately, I was not very good growing up because I had some eye issues that we didn't exactly know about. But anyway, my whole life, I saw these people skiing and on the back of them said, um, blind skier. And as an adult, I rode on a chairlift with a woman who was an ambassador for the National Ability Center. And she said, why don't you do a story about us? And I said, wow, okay. So I skied with um, uh, Patricia, who's one of their top instructors and her student, Jennifer, uh -huh. who happens to be blind and her husband. And honestly, it was, it seemed, the most incredible amount of faith that you have to have that everyone around you is helping you correctly. Um, yeah. She's a great skier. And so they so, work with So how close does the trainer have to be to the actual skier? It evolves over time. One of the first levels is they have a, a bar, like a pole, and the instructor and the student both hold the pole there. Ah, okay. Sometimes the, depending on the levels and the age, the um this the instructor will ski backwards and they'll be you know um like you know mitt to mitt or glove to glove and it, at at some point the skier responds um verbally they can wear a headset mm -hmm. um for the for the paralympic skiers who are blind yeah. they yeah. have someone go first and yeah. they're listening for the cues turn down well, so it sounds like one of the major criteria for doing what you do is curiosity. <laughs> you have to be talking to people because otherwise you're not going to find out about these kind of things. If you hadn't talked to that woman that you were on the, the ski lift with, you wouldn't have found out uh, what she was doing. And then for her to say, hey, why don't you write about us? So maybe curiosity is one of the biggest um, things that you should put on your resume. I'm a very curious person. I talk to everybody. Because, uh, you know, it's, it's the same thing that you need for fiction writing. You have to be a curious person. You do have to talk to a lot of people and find out, well, how do you do that? Why don't you let me watch you? So, you know, like uh, right now when I'm writing for novel number three, and I just came back from New York City where I got to tour a fragrance lab and I'm asking people, you know, so how do you keep from getting overly tired like your nasal passages don't they get yeah. tired after you've been smelling fragrances all day long you know it's just like anything else you do is it, if you do it too often you know are you getting um uh like you know covid nose or <laughs> I don't know, yeah. like what you would that's call a, it that's a good question what do they do it turns out that they actually don't get fatigued uh they have trained their nose in fact they spend years training their noses to identify all these different scents and not get tired. And there is no such thing as um, like you sniff um, coffee. Like sometimes they tell you, oh, yeah. you, you just sniff coffee in between, uh, just like with wine or something like that. No, there's nothing like that. You know, these people are, they have trained their noses so that they can just go from one scent to another to another and still be able to identify exactly what that scent is. Isn't that amazing? They spend yes. like years doing nothing but identifying scents. Wow. Yeah. So, so yeah, so you have to have a curiosity. You have to be interested in what other people are doing. Very interested. Yeah. And also it sounds like you also like being a participant along with, you know, whatever you're doing as a travel writer, you're also along for the ride. And so you kind of, you have to like what it is you're doing. Like you skied with the blind ski people. Uh, you know, you have been on uh, all these cruises with all these people who go traveling in different places. So you're obviously along for the journey as well. A, those are really good criteria, like the curiosity, but also the participant. Because what's happened for me, again, with my hula hoop is it, I really participate in an unusual way. Like the, I got permission in Kenya to bring my hula hoop and hula hoop with the Maasai warriors. Oh. 
so I have always asked permission, but the thing is once you hula hoop with Maasai warriors and they're laughing at each other, <laughs> it so changes the interaction and the photos or mm -hmm. we went to a school it, also in Kenya and I was, a lot of the school children hadn't seen the animals that we had seen on safari. Mm -hmm. And so I sat on the ground and the kids all sat around me and I showed them pictures of the animals and we took pictures of them and we showed them the pictures and those kids, I mean, I was a classroom teacher for a long, long time, but those kids were so snuggled up on me. I look like I'm in a mosh pit. And <laughs> I've seen that photo. You do look like you're in a mosh pit. <laughs> so I think that's one of the things like in the Galapagos Islands, there were choices during the day what to do. And we, I kayaked, I snorkeled with penguins, we went hiking, we saw the blue-footed boobies. And there was one time we were going out to do something. They're like, where is Lisa? They're like, and I was like, I'm coming, I'm coming. Cause I had to change, you know, I was always charging my camera and charging the video, and dry clothes, wet clothes. And I was like, why are you guys all ready? And I'm not, and they're like, this is our first activity today. I'm like, it's oh. my fourth <laughs> <laughs> that's why <laughs> so I think you're right like there's I always want to be in it and um I've stayed at a bunch of different properties where the chef will take me in the kitchen and I get my own hat and like I said I do a lot of video and so I'm always looking for what, what'll look great and what shit what makes people feel like they're there with us yeah yeah exactly how do you know when you are done with an article. First of all, how do you know how to get into the article and how do you know when you're done? Do you have techniques that you employ? Or do you just know like when you're doing your research, uh, talking to people, interviewing with people and you go and you hear something and you go, oh, that's how I'm gonna start the article. That's, it's, that's what happens to me. Does that same thing happen to you? You know, when I'm, when I'm out, I take a lot of notes on my phone in Evernote. And when I'm trying to put together, like, how does this video fit or what is this article about? Sometimes I have something in my notes, like a quote that someone said. Um, sometimes I had the funniest experience, actually, when I was scuba diving in Cuba. I was on the boat with 10 Mexican men, one Israeli paratrooper and me. <laughs> so I spoke a lot of Spanish, but I didn't realize how much Spanish I spoke till I got home and I realized I had taken my notes in Spanish. Wow, you are completely fluent. And I'm, I can get by, but I, I, I've never taken notes like that. But it was, so I think that one of the things that works for me is to be so in the experience and, um, you know, sharing from that. Like, um, you know, for me, there's a bunch of places. It's funny, people say to me, how can you still want to go places? And I'm like, oh my gosh, my, my list is so long. Wow. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, the articles, sometimes I have to get someone else to help me. I'll, I'll sometimes send an article to a friend. I'm like, I'm not sure this really works. It could be awesome or it could suck. Okay. You know, it's hard when you're so close to your work. Yeah. Um, okay. So you have people somehow, uh, sometimes they're chiming in on what they think uh, would be a good article or what they think you could do differently. And you probably have editors who also look it over and go, Lisa, maybe more of this and less of that or whatever, right? Absolutely. Like you said, I'm always pitching people. I've written, unfortunately now, I wrote for Delta and American Airlines magazines, but both of those have sadly closed. Um, I've written for United and Air Canada and all of those editors have, you know, some of those stories, you know, before you go really what they want. And, you know, like I did a story for Air Canada about technology and hotels and, and the robots, like the robot that brings you room service. Uh -huh. So that's like a very specific kind of writing. Whereas on my own site or for my video, I might have a, like a little bit more free form. Um, how's it going to all fit together? Uh-huh. So what is your next destination? When you can go anywhere, what is your next move? What are you dying to do? Well, I've been really investigating what's allowed and what's safe and what's appropriate. For myself, um, last month, I had my very first trip after 
450 days in Los Angeles. <laughs> I went to San Jose and visited some college friends. <laughs> <laughs> Big trip. <laughs> Well, I think what's going to happen a lot for people this summer and fall is people are going to travel to visit family. They're going to try and, you know, celebrate things that they may have missed out on graduations, weddings, birthdays, anniversaries. But after that, um, I've spoke with some of my friends and there's a lot that's open. And one of the things that is really important is how much the places need tourism that you know where i was on safari all of those families and are supported by that so i think it's going to be important that people remember to get back on the road and the other thing i really want to make a plug for is to join the hospitality industry i mean i worked as you said seven years on cruise ships mm -hmm. for me it was incredible my house moved i saw so much but, you know, hotels are opening. One of my friends, Ramsey, wrote an article recently about um, 69 hotels that are opening around the world. There's a, a lot of jobs in hospitality. So I hope that if people love travel as much as you and I do, if you haven't worked in the industry, it could be long hours. You know, I definitely worked a lot when weekends I missed things. But, you know, I also traveled to Australia and to Asia. And I spent three right. summers in Alaska, so. Right, the experiences are still incredible, even if you have to work long hours. Yeah, it, absolutely. And you know, actually, maybe when you're, uh, if, when you're in a different environment working, maybe it seems less like work and more like, oh, here's an experience. <laughs> For me, I, it is. And I know for myself, I've been looking at um, Iceland f starting in July. I know Lindblad is going to be there. And all the companies, I know uh, Lindblad's going to have three ships in Antarctica. Antarctica is my final continent. So I'm looking for that. But for people closer to home, I think there's going to be a lot of interest in anything outdoors like Montana, mm -hmm. uh, P Portland. Mm -hmm. Obviously, Hawaii, everybody's interested always in Hawaii, but that, you yeah. know, there's a lot of outdoors, all the national parks. I know that, you know, if you're going, you would got to check the reservations and can you park and is there space? Yeah. But there's, I can't wait to go. I want to go see the whale sharks in Mexico. Oh, That's the top of my list. Oh, okay. And so um, do you still have your list of 50 things to do before 50 or have you done them all? Well, uh, to be perfectly honest, I did more than 50. Wow. <laughs> I did more than 50 and then I worked with an editor to help me decide what crafted better in the book. You know, okay. some of the things like I was lucky enough to go to my bucket list, which was to scuba dive in Bonaire, which is also open. Mm -hmm. And um, I cannot wait to go back to Bonaire, but that was one of them. But I dove in Aruba, I dove in Bonaire, I dove with the whale sharks in Mexico. And I think I did, you know, 40 dives on three or four different trips. And mm -hmm. so my editor was like, we're not having four chapters. I went scuba diving, I shot sharks, I went scuba diving. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I... I get it. Okay. And when is this memoir coming out? We would like to all know about your memoir. Well, I'm actively searching for an agent for my memoir. I have my completed book proposal. That was my COVID project. And I have quite a bit of it written and I'm still working with the developmental editor who helped me with the outline. Okay. And so hopefully it, it'll, I'm have to way against you know like if i'm invited to iceland and then i want to go back and see bonnie air you know i have yeah. to temper my trips and my videos and the writing and um i know uh italy's opening up and there's so many places to go are the most meaningful articles that you have written combining your travel with maybe something that you learned or an insight that you gained from that place or those people? Is that what makes uh, an article really meaningful to you? That's an excellent, excellent question. And that is exactly what I'm going to focus on going forward. 
Um, I've been thinking a lot during COVID. I did an article for Ms. Magazine about 10 eco adventures. Mm -hmm. And those are the trips that I plan to do either only or more of going forward. I was able to stay at Liku Liku Resort in Fiji. And they are literally saving the Fijian crested iguana. They thought it was extinct. And they discovered two of them, a breeding pair, and they've changed the environment. They're planting, um, they've taken out the, the plants that don't belong and they're planting the native plants. They've taken out the predators. It's amazing. So, so, so uh, as you know, as you're saying this, I'm actually thinking, wow, so there's some really positive things that are happening in this world that you're going to tell us about as you go forward with your travels. And that will make us all feel a lot better, right? I, I, there are everywhere. There's people like when I was um, on my Africa trip, I wrote a story for Ms. Magazine about this incredible bike project mm -hmm. where uh, it's a women's economic development project and the women are taking, the bikes are sent from outside into Africa. The women are trained as mechanics and then they have a job and they make money and they've been paying school fees for children and they rent the bikes and it helps aid workers get to patients who are further away. And those are the stories I love, like the, the iguana story, the bike story, um, uh, here's a funny Ogden story because people love stories about the United States and trains. So I went to Ogden for skiing, but I spent an hour in the museum with the curator. And so it turns out the reason that the United States has time zones is because of the train. Oh, what do you mean? So when the train was built, they built from the east, west, and the west, east, and they met outside of Ogden. And that's where the final spike is. So the train traveled both directions on the track. And at the time, as I understood it, there's like a hundred time zones in America. So the engineer would be saying, well, is the train coming at four o'clock our time? Is that your four o'clock? Is that our four o'clock? Cause they, they can move the trains over so they don't run into each other, but they have to know when the train is coming. So oh. as the curator explained it to me, Congress pass a law. These are the time zones. <laughs> oh okay okay so pacific time zone central mountain all of these had to be established i always wondered about that like why is it that we have these time zones and i'm really looking forward to the elimination of daylight savings because it come it discombobulates me every single time it happens <laughs> my guy my sleep cycle is completely you know turned around <laughs> but um i'll tell you one more funny thing about time zones so yeah. China is a giant country, all on one time zone. Wow. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's actually easier for them or harder? <laughs> well, it means that, you know, it's dark in certain places at what we would consider the wrong time. Right, right. Um, but I, I thought that was amazing. And there's a place, have you ever gone overland between India and Nepal? No, uh -uh. no, there is like a 15 minute time difference. They have, they have this very, <laughs> I don't know the whole country, I can't remember, but we crossed overland from India into Nepal and we were supposed to go to like a, like a Buddhist meditation and uh -huh. we showed up and they had already started. And we're like, why'd you start without us? And they're like, well, you're 15 minutes late. <laughs> Oh, that's funny. Well, Lisa, it has been enjoyable. It has been so fun talking to you about travel. I bet uh, if we, we could just keep talking for hours about all these different little experiences that you've had and the stories that you've had. I just think they're fascinating. I don't think I know anybody else like you. I don't know anybody else who has just uh, on a dime just said, okay, I'm ready to travel. I'm going to go skiing here. I'm going to go diving here. I'm going to go trekking over here. And you just do it. You just go. Yeah, that's just amazing. You must have a bag packed all the time, just ready to go. I used to. <laughs> wow. <laughs> but, you know, I, I'm sure COVID put the kibosh on that. But I, I bet as we come out of COVID again, you're going to have that bag packed and ready to go. 
Well, Lisa Niver, thank you so much for being with us. She is an award-winning travel writer and a science teacher and a podcaster and YouTuber, and she does amazing things on We Said Go Travel. And uh, that is something that I, you guys should all check out on YouTube, see if you can subscribe to it, uh, because she is doing what I think most of us only dream about doing, going to exotic places and doing exotic things. And if you want to be along for the ride with Lisa, but you don't really think that you can leave on a dime with a backpack, uh, you can live vicariously through Lisa's experiences, right? <laughs> Absolutely. I appreciate so much you having me on your show and people can also find me on social media at Lisa Niver. At Lisa Niver. Uh, and I believe you have a, a website also lisaniver.com slash one page. Yes, that is my portfolio for all of my videos and TV segments and articles and awards. And then I also have We Said Go Travel. Yes. So Oh, thank you so thank much. For you. Having me. <laughs> thank you so much, Lisa. Good all luck right. next week with the new book. Thank you. We're all looking forward to The Secret Keeper coming out and talking to everybody who is reading it. So thanks so much, everybody. We'll talk to you later. Bye.